Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly show of What is School for? My name is I. I'm the CEO of Classroom Without Walls and the host of this weekly live streaming show. You can also listen to us on the traditional audio only podcast. Just without walls. And the host is that from me? Live streaming show. You can also listen to us on the traditional audio only podcast. Just was and the host is that from me? Hold on, hold on. Is that from me, Brendan? I think so. Oh, really? Is that from me? Hold on, hold on. Okay, yeah, we already have quite a few people here. Okay, I opened quite a few different windows yes <laughs> so quite the ankle i think we're good now let me know everyone if we're good so this show is uh, inspired by my interview with the one and only seth golden who really challenged me to ask you know what is school for what is the purpose of education so on this show i interview educational leaders teachers, students, parents, entrepreneurs, business leaders to come here to discuss, debate, and disrupt education. Our goal is to future-proof the next generation. Today, I am extremely excited and uh, honored to really uh, interview Brendan uh, Bastid. Uh, Brendan is a thought leader in education. I have been a fan of his work for quite some time. And to get prepared for this interview, I was binge reading all of his articles on Forbes, and I learned so much from him. And every single article is so insightful and thought provoking. Everyone join us live. We are all in for a treat. And today we're talking about college education. And if college is still the golden ticket to career and life success, for those of you who don't know who is Brendan, and he is the president of University Partner and Global Head Learn Work Innovation at Kaplan. And he's also a contributor to Forbes. As I mentioned earlier, I read almost all of his articles and I love every single article. And uh, I already have uh, the link uh, to read his Forbes article for free in the comment section. So make sure you guys check it out. And uh, so you are going to walk away from today's interview with a much better understanding of the current state of art of higher education and what are some of the problems and what are the alternatives and what do we need to do as young people and parents and educators if we truly want to future-proof our children and the students and so much more. So as always, a big shout out to StreamYard for being a sponsor of Classroom Without Walls. Over the last several years, I have tried so many different third-party tools to go live. StreamYard is my favorite. In the comment section, there's a link for you to check out StreamYard for free for two weeks. Definitely check it out. And we are live on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Periscope, on Twitch. And uh, let me know where you guys are joining us live from, social media wise and geographically speaking. Without any further ado, Brandon, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, I. It's good to meet you in person. And uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm I'm as excited as you are to chat. And thank you for the, uh, the very kind uh, introduction as well. Yeah, of course, I'm excited and uh, also a little bit nervous. And uh, every time I feel like you're still so smart, way smarter than me. So, but I promise everyone we're going to have a great conversation. So let's get started, Brandon. Today, we're really talking about college education and if college degree is still the golden ticket to career and life success. And as I mentioned earlier, you wrote so many articles on this topic. And one trend that I noticed is that there is a steady decline in college enrollment over the last 10 years. I actually taught in the classroom for almost two decades. And you wrote in so many of your articles, for example, nearly, and um, I, there's one article that I really love reading that the importance of college has dropped for nearly 50%, five zero. That's a lot, everyone. And also you have another article talking about how Americans are actually now 
uh, ranking an uh, internship at Google as a lot more valuable than a Harvard degree. That was like shocking to me for me to read. And also you have another article and as, uh, as always everyone, all the links are in the comment section so you can check out all of those articles. So here's another article, the numbers are shocking. I share the numbers with my husband. He was like, oh my God. So you said in this article that only 13% of US adults and 11% of C-level executives and 6% of college and university trustees, only this group of people actually strongly agree with the statement that about the work readiness of college graduates. That is a very low percentage. So I want to ask you and start our conversation by telling us what is going on here. Why over the last decade, there is this steady decline in college enrollment. And overall, our faith in college degree has reduced so much. So decode for us, unpack this big picture for us. What is happening? One way to start with that answer is a lot is happening. There are a number of headwinds uh, that that are in front of higher education, right? Some self-induced, uh, others that you know are certainly um, you know a number of factors and market forces, I might call them. But I uh, picking up with the last point that you mentioned, those stats about the low percentages of U.S. adults or C-level executives or even college and university trustee members themselves. Uh, there's just a vote of no confidence mm -hmm. in the work readiness of college graduates. And, you know, that that belief, right, whether half of that is perception and a mix of that is reality, right? Like, I think there's there's a blend of both of those things going on. The point is, there's a vote of no confidence about the work readiness of college graduates. And that is a real problem because the number one reason why people in the United States value higher education is to get a good or better job. Now, let me be very clear. We value higher education for a number of reasons, but by far the number one reason, there isn't a close second place, it's to get a good job or a better job. So you say, okay, the number one reason why we value higher education is this job-oriented outcome, and there's a vote of no confidence on the work readiness of graduates entering uh, into the workplace, right? So to me, and I've said this in several articles, that may be the biggest problem for higher education, the most important thing to address. Now, you say, well, Brandon, what about the rising cost of college? Okay, hard to put those, you know, it's like a neck and neck tie of first and second place. Some days I feel one is, you know, is a bigger issue than other. But of course, the backdrop of this is that since 1980, average college tuition has gone up more than 400%. And during that same time, the median wages of bachelor degree holders in the U.S. has been entirely flat. So the cost of college has gone up astronomically. It's outpaced consumer you know, price index. It's outpaced health care. It's outpaced everything, essentially. And so when you combine this rising cost, this increasing uh, unaffordability of it with doubts about the work readiness, which is one of the most important things that we value, you know, there's your potent mix. So there's other things going on, but I would say those are the two big things if we wanted to kind of get right to the point uh, that are the biggest drivers of this. And it's also why you start to see some of the other data you mentioned that among young adults, 18 to 24 year olds, there's been a 50% drop in their feelings that co going to college is very important. So, mm -hmm. you know, what, what does all this add up to? We've now had 10 consecutive years of declining enrollments in U.S. higher education. And if you look out a bit, we could have 10 more before it turns around because many people have been looking at population age demographics in the U.S. know that we're confronting uh, a dip in the, you know, the number of 18 year olds that are going to be going to college because fewer babies were born 18, you know, 15, 16, 18 right. years ago. Right. So there's a, there are a lot of challenges, but those are the two biggest ones, the rising cost and the lack of uh, you know confidence in the work readiness of graduates. Yeah, I, I so agree with you. I mean, I have been uh, in this space uh, for also 
a few years and those are some of the biggest changes I have noticed. So then like the next natural question is if we have fewer students are choosing to go to college, so where else are they going to become educated, become ready for work? Yeah, and that's a good question, right? There, there, there actually has not been as much research trying to, you know, kind of carefully quantify that as you might think, but you can see it in the rising numbers of new college alternatives that have cropped up in various shapes and sizes, right? So you're seeing it uh, from startups that are very well funded, right? That are creating, you know, kind of fastest path to job format. So that that would be indica uh, indicated by the rise of the you know, the tech boot camps that are being offered uh, by, by third party providers and through universities that have partnered with third party providers. You're seeing it in, um, you know, new job training programs that uh, are both nonprofit and for profit uh, in terms of their, uh, you know, their structure. And, and then you're starting to see, I think the biggest sea change that we're observing is that the epicenter of education is shifting towards mm -hmm. the employer. So, uh, you know, announcements that are very recent, and I know you were going to raise this eye, but, you know, earlier this year, Google came out and announced their new IT certificates that they're going to be providing. And they explicitly said in that announcement that they are going to treat those certificates as the equivalent of a college degree in their hiring process. Now, that was a big statement from Google, but there have been a whole host of large, well-known employers that have come out over the last couple of years saying things like, we used to require a college degree. It's now recommended, but no longer required, right? So they've dropped the degree requirement for job searches and, and, uh, and, and things like that. And then what you're starting to see is more employers offering education you know, degrees as part of their benefits package, right? So if I go get a job at Walmart today or at Papa John's, right? Within a certain period of time, I qualify to get a degree from partner universities that have partnered with those employers. And so my, my simple point here is that you're starting to see what, what you know, the, the, the black box of accreditation, right? This thing that supposedly determines the quality of, of a college degree and, and essentially helps grant the authority of college degrees. The new accreditor uh, is becoming the employer. And what I mean by that is if an employer comes out like Google and says, hey, if you have this tech certificate, I'll hire you, right? And I can validate that through skills and other assessments. Oh, and if you don't have a college degree, no big deal. If you can demonstrate skills on this front, right, we'll hire you. That's an employer directly validating a skill, an educational program, a training program. And you say to the the, the, the person seeking that job and an employer, right? Like if you're if you're both okay with that and it's working, well then, you know, college may not be required there. All that said, we know that there still continues to be value to the college degree. Uh, you know, we're, we're still a long way from parents and students and employers saying the college degree doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. But we're at the beginning of that process in terms of what those signals are in the marketplace right now. Oh, I love everything you mentioned, like so many great insights. And then I, the Google certification came out. I actually shared uh, that on my personal social media channels because I still have many friends, even though I left higher education, I still have many friends who are still teachers in higher education. They were so mad. They were so, so not happy about the change because they feel like they own this territory, they own the space. So I love how you are talking about this right now. This has become a co-shared space where those people who are eventually going to hire our students and working with our students are having a bigger say in the hiring process. And I love changes like that. And based on my own research, I discovered there are at least 20 companies no longer require a college degree, like Google, Apple, those are some big names, IBM, Starbucks. So really exciting. But I also agree with you that it's going to take a long time for everyone to be on board with this. So we got some really amazing comments from our live audience. So here is a great comment from Phil, joining us live from Boston. And... Um, be viewed as an investment, which means it should be uh, subject to a more rigorous cost benefit analysis. I also uh, here is the one I want you to share. He was talking about 
who has he's someone who has experienced co-op. You know, I know that you talked a lot about co-op in many of your articles. And uh, clearly, Phil has benefited from this co-op experience. I wonder if you can also give us some specific examples about like different alternatives that everyone can kind of, because I feel like many parents still think there's only one option to career success, right? That's college. Most parents don't even know what is happening. So can you help us like, you know, a future pacing a little bit to look into the future? What are some of the alternative options already available like co-op and you also mentioned industry certification so anything else you want to share with us yeah sure there's a, there's a few things that i'll touch on and follow up from phil's uh comment and points you know uh one is that there are all kinds of colleges and universities in the u.s at all kinds of different price points that mm -hmm. lead to a number of varied outcomes so you can even look at data in a particular state for example where this data is available you can look at an English graduate from one university in the state compared to an English graduate at another university in the state and see income differentials for those graduates. And you say to yourself, wait a minute, these are English majors in the same state and there's a differential outcome in their earnings, right? So here's the point. There, there are indeed differences in the return on investment calculation of various degrees and, and programs within those degrees. So one and one thing that I think is an empowering point to students and parents is that um, uh, according to alumni, when you do studies, when asking them to rate the quality of their college experience, there is no relationship whatsoever between the price tag of their college and their quality ratings of their experience, which is to say, right, that the price tag does not, if it's an expensive university, it does not necessarily mean that it was the highest quality. And it also doesn't mean that really an expensive university was poor quality. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, yes, there are expensive universities that are well worth it. There are inexpensive universities that are not. But the point is there's no relationship between price tag and that. So if you're still thinking about college, obviously, there are smarter ways for people to explore it. Get off of the idea that it has to be, you know, a prestigious institution, you know, get off of the idea that more expensive equals better. Those things are just not true, right? When you play it on the data. Now back to alternatives, you say, hey, um, if college graduates aren't work ready, what are the magic ingredients that get them work ready? Mm -hmm. And Phil mentioned one, which is a co-op or an internship, some sort of work integrated learning that they've done. And that could take place in high school, that could take place in college. But here's the interesting thing, only a third of college graduates graduate from college having had a job or an internship during college where they were able to apply what they were learning in the classroom. So although it's happening for some, I mean, here's the point, two thirds of college graduates are leaving college having had no work integrated learning experience. And so whether it's a co-op, an internship, uh, you know, another kind of you know, form of work, right? There's a lot of derivatives of that. Um, and certainly apprenticeship is a, is a topic that's been around for a long time. Apprenticeship is making a revival because it's now being extended into technical programs, IT, et cetera, right? So apprenticeship is growing here, it's growing globally. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of alternatives, but I think the, the most important thing is to think about if I'm gonna, you know, I'm in high school or I'm a parent of a high school child or going to college or a parent of a college student, the, the one of the most valuable things that we can do is uh, make sure that students have work integrated learning opportunities as part of that experience and the other thing that i would focus on is taking classes that require long-term projects yeah. and that's something that you know you, you think sounds really simple but again only a third of college graduates uh report having done a class that took uh you know required a project that took a semester or longer to complete i mean and, and those who did by the way it doubled their odds of being engaged in their work later in life so you know, those are some of the magic ingredients, long term project, a work integrated learning experience. And if you if you go through college and miss both of those, shame on you and shame on the institution that you graduated from. I mean, I, I can so relate. And I'm, I'm shocked and now shocked by only one third of college students are actually taking an internship. You really wonder, like, 
how can we even graduate without taking an internship? Right? I feel like even starting high school students should be taking internships. So I also want to like uh, follow up on what you mentioned, Brandon. Is do you think college or high school are the only places for students to gain, you know, work on long term projects, to gain internship experiences? I ask this question because. As someone as crazy as me being very disruptive, I personally have met and worked with lots of students who are self-educated outside the traditional educational system. I know homeschoolers, unschoolers, and they do all sorts of things. And they are they have even more skills and also very financially successful. So do you think going to college and going to high school are the only places for them to gain, as you say? triple threat to become triple threat graduates? Well, the, the simple answer is no. There's a lot There's a lot of pathways that, that somebody could accomplish those outcomes. Um, what we need to do though, is make sure that those who are going through our high school system and our, you know, our, our, our higher ed system, those are, those are critical experiences that happen for all students, if not the vast majority, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, when I look at this landscape, right, I'm, uh, you know, I, I endorse a number of different pathways to success because, of course, there's, you know, every one of us has a unique talent DNA, right? Just like our fingerprint, every human on the, on the planet has a different fingerprint. We also have a different talent profile, right? And a different set of motivations that bring us to, you know, excellence and whatever it is that we do. So, um, you know, so, to, so to, to say there's one pathway or there's a, you know, there's a you know traditional path that everybody has to follow. That I think is a false narrative. Um, but if you say, okay, forget about what it is. Talk about the ingredients. Okay, mm -hmm. so take us outside of this conversation or paradigm of high school or college. And I mentioned a couple of them. Right? It's it's having an opportunity to connect the dots between things that you're learning and things that you're doing. Right? So that's that work integrated learning thing. So it's not as simple as reading a book. And, you know, thinking about something from a theoretical perspective, that's very valuable. But how do you connect that to having done a hands on project of some sort, having had to work with other people to accomplish that, having had to go back to the drawing board and iterate over time because you keep getting feedback, you do a trial and error process. Right. The things I'm describing here sound like people's jobs. It's what people do in work. And, mm -hmm. and this is true across the proverbial white collar to blue collar jobs, everything in between, right? We work on projects that last more than a split second, right? We're not taking pop quizzes uh, all day as part of how we're measured. In fact, most of us never take a standardized test after we leave high school, right? And, you know, so so you just say, okay, um, you know, wh where where are we going wrong? So back to this you know, learn and do combination. There's so many different ways to make those things connect. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's also, uh, you know, I, I go back to the Latin root of the word education here, which, which translated means to lead out of. And the reason why I always like to bring this up is because I think, unfortunately, we've created an education system that's been designed more to stuff things into students than to lead things out of them. And when you start to think about leading out of, what does that mean? Well, mm -hmm. that means you have to get to know that person. If you're a teacher, you have to get to know what motivates me in order to help me learn. You have to, some students love competition, others hate it, right? So if I don't know that as an educator, I could you know, uh, terrify a student or demotivate them, right? And, um, and then you know, we have to give them opportunities to uh, to to try things, to apply things, to do different kinds of job, to observe different kinds of work, because one of the big issues is most of us have a very narrow view of the kinds of jobs that exist in the world. Right? Mm -hmm. We might know what our parents did or do. We might know about Uncle Billy or whatever. Right? Like, but but if you were to sit down and say, write down the list of all the different jobs in the world, most of us would be stumped after fourteen or fifteen. And of course, it's just this incredible diversity of work opportunities that exist. And um, we just don't spend a lot of time exploring those. And, and school, you could argue, takes us away from that. I'll make a simple point. Parents, very well intentioned over the last couple decades, have put so much emphasis on grades and test scores <laughs> that they've actually, I've heard this, I've heard it, you know, parents saying, well, 
I don't want you to work son or daughter because you need to focus on getting good grades and, you know, good test score. And, and so, you know, if, if I have the, if, if we have the ability to, to, for you not to work, right, your job is school. And just think about that. Like that sounds very well intentioned until you realize how important work experience is and work integrated learning is. You go, wait a minute. No, no, no. Whether you need to work or you don't, you know, you, you don't have to work, put that aside. There's great value. There's learning value in work. And we have de-emphasized that over multiple generations. In fact, uh, this current generation of 18 to 24 year olds is the least working generation mm -hmm. in U.S. history. They work fewer hours than any generation in the history of our country. So you say, why would we think that they're work ready? None of them have any work experience. <laughs> so. Oh, my God, my, my muscle hurts me because I'm smiling so much. Every single point that you mentioned resonated so much with me. I don't know if you read the study saying that like uh, GPA in the US, a great point average is actually universally related to innovation. But almost every single parent I talk to is about, you know, I grew up in that environment. My job is to study, you know, or as many as A's, you know, 4.0 as possible. So it's so refreshing to hear what you said. And I love this concept of project-based learning, right? Semester long, working on projects, you involve the mind, the hand, and the heart. That's what learning is supposed to be. So we have 30 plus people live with us right now. I'm really having a hard time catching up with everyone's comment. So give me some time. If you have a question, if, um, just say question, and then that will really help me spout the comment. Okay, thank you so much. So Craig asked you, so in the technology space, and there's increasing number of institutions only requiring, not requiring a degree, but only, you know, certifications. Are you seeing this trend in other sectors? And uh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a good question, Craig. I mean, you know, certainly we've talked about some of the growing uh, prevalence of these college alternatives and what I'll call employer direct training education solutions. Um, you're certainly seeing examples of employers just going and doing it on their own, right? Uh, but I continue to believe and be optimistic that there is a role for colleges and universities in this. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, employers have not built robust education and training programs. They're, they're, some of them are investing in this and their own capabilities of doing it, um, but many of them still are eager to have a partner or multiple partners in that process, right? The trick is, to what degree is that university willing to engage in employer partnerships, willing to engage in non-degree education? Because, you know, look, there's this belief in higher education that, you know, what we do here is degrees. We confer degrees. Well, you know, if you look at the degree enrollments in U.S. higher education, it's gone down for mm -hmm. 10 consecutive years. What's growing in higher education? Non-degree educational programs, certificates, mm -hmm industry recognized credential training that's being offered by universities, right? So um, it's really gonna come down to the, the innovativeness of an institution high, of higher learning to you know, make it an aggressive goal of theirs to partner with employers and to be open to delivering a number of types of education. And I'll go a little astray here on this topic is most people when I talk about this think I mean only industry specific skills. That's mostly what it is. But, you know, I think there's an opportunity for universities to take aspects of the classic liberal arts mm -hmm. and bring it to corporate training. Mm -hmm. what, what, what's prevented that, though, is that the classic kind of liberal arts mindset is that this is about a degree. But I, I go back to one of the most important courses I've ever taken in my life. It was a course on leadership and it was taught through Shakespeare. Aww. And, you know, so here's my point. Right. Like, why wouldn't a university unbundle that Shakespeare course on leadership and offer it for executive training or a corporate partnership, right? It was a course inside of a bachelor's degree that I took, but uh, that would be an example of not just, you know, industry skill specific training, but taking really valuable aspects that employers really want and, and, and value in employees, you know, this, the supposed, you know, critical thinking and, you know, collaboration and teamwork. Well, so I still think there's a promising future for higher ed here, but it's not always going to be through degree-based programs. 
Definitely. Yeah. That's why at my little school, I give all of my students a LinkedIn learning where they can actually acquire quite a few like different certifications. I mean, for me, if I hire people, I trust a lot more. Can you show me the skill as opposed to, you know, the show me economy as opposed to you're telling me through that piece of paper. I don't even know how to interpret. Look at some of the course titles. You don't even know what this course is about, right? It's like, that's right. It's like a different language. So I want to make sure to ask this a uh, good question from Pooja, joining us live from India. Thank, thank you for staying up late. She's a young student or maybe uh, older, but like around like 20 years old or something. And so she asked, how can we make students or adults to consciously pursue what they really, what they are really obsessed for rather than just satisfying parents or other people or our society's expectation by graduating with that piece of paper? Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, I'll, um, I'll maybe, you know, uh, talk about, you didn't use the word passion in that question, but that's, it's one of the things I get a question about a lot, you know, well, you know, how do I pursue my passion? And, you know, isn't that what this is about? And, you know, I've got a couple interesting thoughts on that. I mean, certainly, when people discover things that they're excited about and interested in, um, that you know that you know that's a magical thing, right? But it's not always the case that somebody's passion aligns with an ability to make money, okay? And or I'll just say a living. I'm not talking about making a lot of money, but making a living. And so you could have passions that you can't really earn anything with, right? Like I love basketball. I wish I could have made a living as a professional basketball player. That did not happen. Um, and I knew that pretty early on that that wasn't going to happen, right? So, you know, you draw a distinction there. He here's the thing that I think students need, to, young people in general, and even, even many adults uh, that have been in the workplace for a while need to think about. What am I really good at? Mm -hmm. So there's this concept that many of you have heard of called flow, right? Flow is when we just get into a zone where we lose track of time because we're so engaged in whatever it is that we're doing. And flow certainly has some relationship with what your passions and interests are, but it's more about you're in a moment where you're doing something that you excel at. And so, you know, that's the real trick is trying to do a number of things to figure out what am I really good at? Because I can tell you, if you can do a job where every single day at some point in that day, you touch that moment when you're doing the thing that you are the best at, that's where you get to flow, right? So it's a little different than passion. Uh, and I just wanted to point that out because you could have a, a, a perfectly terrific life having a side passion project and doing work that really suits the things that you're very good at, right? And so that that's just one way to think about it. My point going back to this um, is that in high school and college, we don't give young people enough opportunities to try things, to test things, to explore different jobs, right? To like try a job on, like you try a, you know, a, a pair of, uh, you know, clothes on, you know, an out, a new outfit on, like you're going to see, hey, you know, does this, does this look good on me? Do I like it? Right? I mean, we need opportunities to try jobs on in different ways. And that can be done by talking with more people. There's a lot of kind of career exploration programs that are, you know, starting mm -hmm. to come online these days. Um, doing job shadows, right? Thinking about internships. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this. We just need to take more time and carve out more time in the school day to make sure those things are happening. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. Thank you for answering that question. By the way, Pooja is only 18 uh, going to college. I hope that answer is helpful for you. So I was trying to read this long question and comment from I think from Dan, thank you for joining us live in Maryland. And uh, actually my husband. <laughs> so he he said it's a great uh it's a great comment. He said that uh, many countries provide government subsidized education. And uh, he said that the fundamental philosophy is that an educational workforce is beneficial for the state. And many uh situations, the fact that in the US is like tuition research uh, driven. So I saw where I came from research one University of Syracuse and University of Maryland. So the question he's asking you is, uh, Brandon, should we start incentivizing and normalizing the experience based education with more government funding? Well, it's a good question. I mean, we've we've got levers at the federal level and the state level um, in terms of incentives or you could think of it as penalties for 
how to motivate um, or or penalize our you know our K twelve uh, systems and and colleges and universities. I would say, you know, the the things I've already talked about is where I would go with this answer. What what is our education system falling short on? Mm-hmm. It's falling short on students having opportunities to do project based learning and long term projects. It's falling short on any kind of work integrated learning experiences. Those things get harder when you get below high school, right? So you say, well, you know, middle school and elementary school kids can't really work. No, but they can do work simulated projects in school, right? And so, you know, and we can do this in all subjects. People think about the STEM subjects like, oh, yeah, you can build a robot. And but you you can do this in any any subject. I was at one of the um, high tech high schools on a visit. And these are, you know, a, a group of schools that have just completely transformed education. I know I, you're, you're familiar with them, but, you know, the day I was there, I was observing a Spanish class, okay? And they were doing a project-based learning exercise. Well, what does that look like in Spanish? Well, they had students in groups of three sitting at tables together, and their assignment was to um, come up with a postcard that they would mail home to their family on an imaginary vacation in a Latin American country. So the students, right, they had to think about, okay, well, where am I gonna go on this imaginary vacation? Which country, right? I'm gonna be in Costa Rica, whatever. One of them was designing the postcard. The others were trying to figure out how do you say parasailing in Spanish, right? Because they were trying to describe what they were doing on this vacation. And I just sat there and I thought, you know, if you can do this kind of project based learning in Spanish class, right, like we can we can do this in every subject. It just requires a little bit of imagination. And then what's fascinating, though, is that I was spending time with the teachers after this conversation. And I said, so how did you know, you know, how did you get trained on project based learning? Like, how did you get into this? Because most ed schools, you know, Mm -hmm. haven't really put a big focus on this, at least not historically. And one of the teachers was like, well, you know, um, she said the first semester I did it, it wasn't, you know, that easy. But she said after the first semester, it just started to feel natural. And she's Mm -hmm. like, we built a core of other teachers and their ideas feed off of our, you know, my ideas and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it might have taken a semester to kind of get the feel for it, but it wasn't much more than that. And so to back to that question, right, I do think there are ways to say right? Uh, We're going to open up new funding mechanisms or we're going to tie existing funding mechanisms to uh, seeing improvements in the number of project-based learning, long-term, you know, project work integrated learning activities that are happening in school. And here's a big one. This is going to sound a little controversial. In doing so, we're going to probably have to have some sort of partial moratorium on standardized testing. Mm -hmm. So here's this is an interesting point. Uh, about five years ago in the state of Texas, uh, kids in grades nine through 12 had to take about 20 standardized tests required. And recent legislation two, three years ago has dropped that down now to about five or six, I believe. So I might be off on the numbers, but order of magnitude, right? They were previously required to take three to four times more standardized tests. They started to analyze it and realize that almost a quarter of all school days were spent on test prep or test taking. (laughs) And so, look, I love accountability measures, right? But when you start to get to a place where a quarter of all the days of education and learning are tied to, you know, to testing, and then to think about how, you know, I mean, there's a little relationship between testing and success later in life. It's not a very strong one. And it also has uh, bias in a lot of these tests, right? There's racial bias, there's cultural bias, there's a number of things. So I don't wanna pick on tests right now. It's just a simple point that we put a lot of emphasis on tests and grades. And what we're gonna have to do is de-emphasize those a little bit in order to make room for things like evaluating projects that students do. Well, that's more you know, subjective, but it's, it's very valuable because that's mostly what happens in the workplace. Mm. I love oh, so many great points. I, I think we really have to, if we are talking about changing education, we need like definitely smaller size. You have given us so many examples to really show that learning has to be personal. I was, I used to teach classes like 300 students, 400 students. And then on top of that, I have a huge load of doing research, right? I think that's what most research university want the professors to do. Like, 
teaching, to be honest, was my least concern. I don't think I was doing a good job to serve my student. And the only way was to do lots of multiple choice exams because I had to survive my research requirement. Otherwise, I'll be fired. So I really think from even outside the classroom, we need a more systematic change so that we can give teachers more support to think outside the box, to be creative, to do more, implement more project-based learning as opposed to only look at the numbers. That's how I will be evaluated. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So here is, yeah, yeah, go quick, ahead. We'll get to that question real quick. I'll just put a fine point on it. Employers would rather hire a B student with an internship than an A student with no internship. Mm -hmm. So read into that, right? They're not saying grades don't matter, but they're willing to trade a whole grade level for a student who's had valuable work experience. So that's a way to think about it, right? It's not to say grades don't matter at all. That would be untrue. But it's also to say that that work integrated learning is really valued. Yeah, totally. <laughs> And one of my favorite books is uh, A students work for C students, B students work for the government. So kind of like resonating with what we are seeing here. And That's so here is um, a great comment from Cynthia. I want to show it because she is an amazing educator herself. And she said that it's really hard for students who haven't been engaged in learning from a place of interest or passion. You know, you were talking about this. So much of public school experience is passionless. And this is the students that I deal with. They ask me all the time, what do I want? Instead of trying to look within, what do they want? So what do you say about that, Brendan? Well, you know, thank you, Cynthia, for asking this question. And I know this is a big part of your, you know, philosophy and, and you're spot on, right? Um, we don't talk about this a lot, but, um, you know, emotional engagement and learning is critical. It's fundamental, right? So you, you can have a student that memorizes something, they master the material, right? And, and to Cynthia's point, are doing it uh, in a passionless, you know, type of, uh, you know, format, learning is, is, is more effective when we can uh, embed emotion in that learning, emotion through the relationship that we have with a supportive teacher or mentor, right? Emotion in terms of the connections that you can build with the other learners that you're going through the experience with, emotion in that I'm connecting to this because it's just so interesting and fascinating, right? And and I do think, you know, we uh, in the quest for things like a standardized curriculum, because, of course, with a standardized curriculum, it's easier to do standardized testing. Right. I mean, you know, now we keep anteing both of those things up. And what you, you lose is you lose a lot of the diversity of learning that can happen outside of core subject areas, you know, allowing students to paint or draw outside the lines. You know, these are, you know, expressions, but they're also literal in many cases. Right. I mean, I've seen common core come to art and one of the top you know teacher of the year in the state of maryland actually this was maybe six or seven years ago an art teacher quit her job because when common core came in they basically said here's how you teach art and mm -hmm. she was like no that's not like i'm out right and and again I, you know i don't want to pick on common core i'm using these as, as illustrative examples of where we can go overboard you know in our quest to standardize education or standardized tests so we can eat more easily measure students and, and hold schools accountable. Uh, you know, we, we lose sight of what this is fundamentally about at its core, which is trying to understand what makes an individual learner tick and then engaging them in that process. And I'll, I'll use another example. And, you know, any of you who've been in classrooms as teachers, you know, know this well. One of the one of the schools I visited a couple of years ago um, was a was a fir first grade classroom that I was observing, and one of the teachers had little pods of like four or five students at a table. They were alternating different stations that they were working on, but at this one particular spot, you know, she knew the kids really well and she knew what they were excited about. So you know, little first grade Brandon, she would say, "Now Brandon, you know, if you want to be an NBA basketball player someday, right, you're going to need to. And then she gave me a math problem that had something to do with basketball. Right. And and then, you know, the next kid was interested in race cars. And so she's like, you know, well, I if you you know, if you're excited about race cars, right, she 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 knew what got them excited and she gave them questions and examples that played off of that right now. That teacher had to know that that teacher had to ask those questions of those kids to get to that point. 
But like that is just a simple example of what makes learning come to life. It's about making an emotional connection to learning. We've lost sight of that in ways that are really troubling. Oh, amen. I remember this quote, right? People don't remember what you say, but they remember how you make them feel. Talking about the emotional connection, especially as a teacher, I, I think there are also lots of studies that have shown that when students have that emotional connection with the professor or teacher, they are more invested in learning. They are more likely to perform really well in those classes. Yeah. Here Absolutely. is yeah, here's a question. We have all those great questions. We won't be able to answer all of them. And we'll be wrapping this up in 10 minutes. Amira, and so she asks, how can employers get more savvy about their ROI on their talent? Oh, great question. Some of them are providing unique uh, training uh, during internships, but uh, they fail retaining that person talent. Yeah. Well, I'll start with um, one of the points that you just left off on about, you know, great teachers, right? What do great teachers do? They build relationships with their students. They get to know what makes each one of them uh, motivated and tick differently. You know what's interesting? That's also what the best managers do. And so, you know, there's a couple points I would make about this, you know, employer uh, training ROI. You know, some of it is indeed about the training and incentives. A lot of turnover in companies is about who your manager is. And this is this is, you know, some of the most invaluable advice that comes from years of Gallup research. And I spent seven years at Gallup, so I know this stuff very well. But, you know, 70 percent of the variance for how you feel about your job is accounted for by who your manager is. You either have a great manager or you know, on the other end, you could have a terrible manager. Right. And. So the point here is that like a teacher can make such a huge impact on a student's life, so does a manager in the workplace. And so if you say, what's the one thing I would want to make sure I'm the best at as an employer, it's having the world's best managers. What do the world's best managers do? They get to know what makes each of their employees tick differently and mm -hmm. they help job shape their roles to get them to a place where they do the things they're great at every day, right? This goes back to my point about flow, right? So uh, so that I know that wasn't where you wanted me to go with that question, but I, I, I wanted to add that context. Now, back to the training, you know, there's all kinds of incentives involved. Like you're seeing fascinating examples right now where Amazon Career Choice Program for, for, for one, uh, they, they literally have designed the program so that frontline employees at Amazon can get jobs elsewhere. And you say, well, wh wh why would they do that? Well, they, they're hiring so many people, right? And in, in, in that hiring, right, they have the short-term benefit of retention for those who enter into the career choice program. But ultimately, they're, they're trying to get them to a better, higher paying job elsewhere because in some respects, there's just not enough manager level jobs at Amazon compared to how many employees they're hiring. I think they've hired half a million new employees since March, right? Think about that. Yeah. I mean, it's like 2,800 a day or or some crazy figure like that. And then, you, you know, you've got a lot of other programs where while you're there, you can pursue your college degree. You can bet that the retention of those employees is astronomically high because I enroll an associate degree program and, and my employer's helping pay for it or paying for it entirely. I'm going to probably stay until I finish that at least. And then when I do, I sit and say, wow, this employer helped me get my college degree. Mm -hmm. If I'm pursuing a bachelor's degree, like I might be in that program for four years, right? So there's no doubt that the right kinds of training programs, right, um, offered by employers are, are leading to long-term retention, but you're also seeing really innovative models like Amazon's career choice, where it's designed to help you get a job elsewhere. And guess what? Everybody wins, right? In that, in that scenario, everybody wins. Yeah, oh, great answer. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm just uh, reading this uh, comment from Carla. Thank you for joining us live, my friend. And she said that she loves that you mentioned that this comes out of flow and she's a certified flow consultant. I didn't even know that you can become certified, which also reminds me of, I want to share my screen real quick, kind of uh, what uh, Pooja was asking earlier. Are you familiar, uh, Brandon, with uh, Ikigai, the concept? Uh, no, not as not, no. not I've heard yeah. it, but I, I'm not familiar with it. 
Yeah, so this is kind of what you said earlier, right? So doing what you love in this flow, but also not only doing what you love, but you also want to make sure what you love, actually, there is a financial need. People actually need this, that people will actually pay for you. So what this talks about is, uh, Pooja, I think you should definitely check this out. Aikigai is to find that sweet spot where is the overlapping point between doing what you love and the, what the, uh, the society actually needs and what people can actually pay you for and what you are really good at. So you want to consolidate, look at this, consolidate all of them, and then you will be in that flow state. Yeah, so I just want to share this real quick. That's and, great. Uh, yeah, very just, similar concept, yeah. Very similar, very similar. You wish, yeah. you know, like actually bring up to my next question. So unfortunately, this year, um, Sir Ken Robbins passed away. I, but I, his work has made such a huge impact on my life, you know, as a mom, as a homeschooling mom, and as, as an educator. So one of my favorite quotes from him is regarding um, the purpose of education. What is really the purpose of education? And he said that the goal of education is to really help our children to discover and to understand the world around them as much as understanding the world inside them. So I feel like, you know, this is my humble opinion. I feel like the current educational system is not doing a good job at really empowering our children to discover what is within them, their own passions and talents, going back to this Aiki guy, the flow, what you were talking about earlier. So I want to take uh, ask your perspective on this. So what do you think about the current education in terms of helping our children discover the outside society, the outside world, as well as this big universe within them? Well, look, you know, we could do better on both fronts. I think we're probably doing, um, relatively speaking, better on helping them understand the world a little bit, right? But that's in that's in narrow definitions, right? That might be in geography, that might be in social studies, that might be in you know science where you're learning about you know universe, planets, uh, right? So um, so look, I, I mean, I think we're, we're we're doing relatively fine on that category. The how to understand myself, that's where we're falling down the most, right? Because for the most part, we've designed uh, a standardized curriculum that's built around being measured by standardized type exams and assessments. And of course, we need to do that because the scale is so, you know, I mean, we need to do that to some degree because we've got scale and numbers and all kinds of things that make it very difficult. We also have lots of demands, right? Where people believe there's certain things that every kid should know. <laughs> so, you know, and we hold on to those, you know, those beliefs about what people should know. Well, guess what, you know, um, I'll, I'll say my one education regret, I took some foreign language in high school, but I never learned how to fluently speak a foreign language. Guess what? Mm -hmm. I'm not alone. Most Americans who went to school in the United States were exposed to foreign language, but never were able to speak it, right? And so you go, well, was that a waste? I don't think it was a waste, but, but here's my point, right? What we need to know now is very different than what a student needed to know 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. The new foreign language today is coding, right? The new foreign language today would be data science and data literacy. You know, no one would have talked about data science and data literacy or coding 20 years ago. We were barely talking about coding 10 years ago, and we've really only been talking about data science and literacy for the last four or five years, right? And of course, curriculum just hasn't caught up with that. So, you, you know, we, we need to have, it, it's a balance here of, Sure, I think we're going to continue to have some sort of standardized educational content that we're going to want schools to teach, but we need to make more room for their own pursuits, right? So some of you are familiar with the concept of the 20% time in, in employers, yeah. where a lot of forward-thinking employers now give their employees 20% of their time to just explore projects, to work on something that they're interested in, right, that might, might have some potential. So... I think we need to bring that to schools where one day of the week, right, 20% time is dedicated to a student's own pursuit of their interest. Now, it could be shepherded and guided by a teacher, so there's still a role. It could be done in groups of students where they have to work in teams, um, but but I think, you know, we, we should be able to carve out that precious time in school 
Um, but gosh, you know, you go to any superintendent or principal and say, hey, can you, could you give me a day a week where kids could, and their, their heads will just explode, right? <laughs> we need to help them with that. That's right. That's right. That's why I actually how, how we do homeschooling. So I we homeschool our children, and so they will actually use the morning time to do whatever curriculum, so that we have something to show to the homeschooling review committee. But in the afternoon, a big chunk of their time is to I work on their passion project, whatever selling stuff on eBay, work on their YouTube videos, all those things. So I agree. I think you know if we have more autonomy to really yeah. implement this twenty person principle, that would be really really awesome, and. Uh, I have a, a one more question and then we're going to share uh, with our audience where people can learn more about you. So you have a very impressive and successful career, Brendan, and clearly you are very smart, very knowledgeable. So I want to ask you if you can reflect on your personal success. So what do you think are the specific hard and soft skills that you have developed along the way that really contributed to your success today? Those are always the toughest questions to answer, I, because you're, you know, the, the self-reflective moments are, they're, they're, they're difficult. They're really important, but they're difficult. I mean, I would say a couple things. Um, you know, I've been uh, in the education world my entire career. I never, I never thought that would be the case. Like if you had asked me in college, even where you thought, you know, where, where do you think you'll be, Brandon? I, I don't, I wouldn't have said education. Um, it doesn't surprise me that I've been in education because it's been such a major, major part of my life. But, um, you know, when I reflect on things that have been the most valuable to me, I barely remember the content in a lot of the classes I took. I remember some of it, right? Um, I remember entirely the relationships and mentors that I've had. And many of them were, in, they were teachers. They were incredible teachers who were mentors and guides to me. And for whatever reason, um, maybe it was my parents, maybe it was just an instinct I had. I always invested in those relationships from my end of things, right? So it's one thing to have a teacher tap a student on the shoulder and say, "Hey, you know, uh, you know," and and give them some help and guidance, and you know, and kind of uh, build a mentoring relationship. Mentees can, you know, seek mentors as well. And I vividly remember in college, uh, my junior year, I took a class with Joel Fleischman. Um, and at the end of that class, I, I talked to Joel and I said, Joel, would you be my mentor? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I mean, to this day, Joel is my mentor. You know, I've been, you know, graduated from college more than 20 years. He still sends me books that he wants me to read. He still corrects my grammar and emails that I send him. Um, you know, and, but my point is that, uh, I don't know if that was just an instinct I had, if I got lucky. But um, those mentoring relationships were things that both parties have to invest in. You can't just expect teachers to do it. Um, and, you know, the student has to invest. And so, you know, when I go back and think about where I, I feel like I got my greatest development, it was by learning from, from mentors and by observing people who I really admired, right? I really admired my parents. And there were things I didn't admire about them, but I took the qualities that I admired about them and I wanted to amplify that. And so, you know, now you say, did somebody teach me those things? Yes, yeah, sort of. Um, and then here's one final point. You know, one of the things that I've, I've used a lot in, in my career, you know, I've been a, a, an entrepreneur, a multi-time entrepreneur. I've worked inside, you know, well-known organizations like Gallup and Kaplan and very entrepreneurial roles within those organizations. And you know, I've been in, involved in research and, you know, education and other things. Communication, writing, these were things that um, I feel like I had some natural ability for, but mm -hmm. I, I was not a very good writer in college. And I'll just leave everybody with this last story. Back to Joel. This is my junior year in college, mind you. And every week we had to turn in a 10 page paper. So it was a heavily writing intensive course. And he took the first 30 minutes of every class to go through gr grammatical errors in people's papers. Wow. And he would always start with the one paper with the most errors and then go through the deck. Well, he never read the names of the students, but my paper was always the first one, right? And I mean, it was, I just read ink. This is back in the day when you get red ink on your paper, you know, you weren't actually like, you know, turning it in in a digital fashion. And, um, you know, 
it, it wasn't a class on writing. It was a class on nonprofit law and philanthropy. But he insisted that his students become better writers. And, and over time, I started writing more and writing more and writing more. Well, you know, now, I mean, I'm not a writer as my profession, but I published 30 some articles this year. And it's a major part of what has helped me become successful. But if you had said, Brandon, are you a great writer? My sophomore year in college, I would have said, no. <laughs> Junior year, I would have said, well, I'm getting there, but Joel doesn't think so. And, and you know, so, I, you know, it, it's it's those are some of the things I reflect on. But um, it's, uh, you know, it's still a journey. I mean, the part of the fun I have is that I feel like I'm I'm still learning and developing and growing, even though I'm 43 years old. <laughs> uh, a true lifelong learner. And thank you for sharing that really incredible story. And you are amazing, like a writer. I loved I was binge reading like like nonstop. All of your Forbes article, like each of them is so good. Everyone should read it. And you know, the link is in the comment section. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Lifelong, lifelong learner. Yeah, yeah, great. So share with us, where can people learn more about you? I have been sharing your LinkedIn, but are there any other additional channels that people can connect with you? Yeah, well, you, you've mentioned both of them, I, and I appreciate it. You know, LinkedIn, I spend I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. I'm not a big Twitter guy. Uh, you know, Facebook is very rare. So it's, you know, my, my, my energies are put into LinkedIn. Um, and it's an incredible community on LinkedIn, lots of great dialogue. Um, and then, you know, I primarily write for Forbes. Uh, we'll occasionally do articles in other publications. But I think, yeah, the best the best two places would be Connect with me on LinkedIn, um, and uh, and certainly you know follow my you know my Forbes uh, column profile for for articles that are published there. Yeah, all of those articles are about education. If you are a parent or educator, you should definitely check out all of those articles. Each of them is just like so 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 good. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for spending an hour and four minutes with us, Brenda. I know you are super busy, and you had no idea how much this means to me and how excited I was. And uh, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us live from all over the globe. I <laughs> just see that uh, Puja is inspired by you to disrupt education in India. So yeah, go for it, right? Go for it, yeah. Just tell you who, right? So yeah, thank you for joining us live from all over the globe. I really appreciate you guys. And this will be the last show of this entire year. So thank you for spending the entire year with me on what is school for. So I will resume the show again after the holiday next year in January. So stay in touch with me and happy holidays, everyone. And thank you so much. Make sure you guys check out and follow Brendan. Bye everyone. Thank you, I. Have a great holiday. Bye-bye everybody. Bye.